Today, we're going to have the Voyage to the Country. I had a kinder. So, are you ready to start? We live on Mandarin land. We have on Mandarin land. We thank the Mandarin people for taking care of our land. We play on Mandarin land. We play on Mandarin land. We thank the Mandarin people for taking care of our land. This is what happens when you try working from home on school holidays a drummer and a guitarist uh, forming a street band in the bedroom next door. Well, here we go again. Lockdown number five, whatever. And Pete, we do hope that you're able to get some time to get some work done, but also have some time to have fun with the kids and the family at this time. I don't know how and what your plans are for this time, everyone, in this version of lockdown. We hope it will not be very long. But many of us do find lockdowns very hard. You may be finding yourself getting angry at our politicians, whether they be our state ones, local, for going so hard so early. Or maybe the opposite, that you're angry with our interstate colleagues for going so long before they decide to take the steps to lock down. Or maybe you're angry or upset with the people who didn't follow the regulations and rules they're supposed to, and as a result, we're all put at risk. Maybe alternatively, you're feeling frightened or feeling dragged down in the midst of this time and feeling maybe rather sad or withdrawn. In the midst of this time, maybe you'd rather be somewhere else, maybe on holidays like our colleague Tina. Maybe you'd love to be able to spend some time under the stars or on the beach in sunny Queensland. Or maybe you'd rather be swimming in beautiful waters with the creatures of the sea or rather in the bush, or even today just playing with your friends and with your community in worship together. But it's times like this we need to pause, an enforced pause. And rather getting angry at others, sometimes we can take the opportunity to listen and find something more in this space. So I invite you to do so. Like the prophets of old who, in getting away from those who were oppressing or chasing them, or where they were in absolute turmoil, it was not until they paused to listen did they hear the voice of God, in quiet and in silence. So I invite you then, on this occasion, to be still and to listen. Maybe get yourself a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or something else and sit and take time to pause, to listen to the voice of God in the music, in the readings and the proclamation of the scripture. Take time in prayer to reflect and listen and respond to the leading of God's spirit God's Word in the flesh God's Word in the ancient book Listening We're a listening people God's Word in the wind God's Word coming fresh today Listening We're a listening people what is God's present work? How are we stirred? Where might we open now to deeper love for the world? God's Word in the flesh God's Word in the ancient book Listening, we're a listening people. 
has distracted us We've not heard you How can we tune your church To ringing evermore true God's word in the flesh God's word in the ancient book Listening We're a listening people God's word in the God's present work rouse us awake how are we ready to embody your word today The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. And then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognised them and saw them leaving and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Well, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Well, late in the afternoon, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to near the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, You feed them. With what? they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. Well, how much bread do you have? He asked. Go and find out. And they came back and reported, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Well, Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and he looked up towards heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He even divided the fish for everyone to share. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish 
a total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Wow. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and headed across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on the land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. And he intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I'm here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed for they still did not understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. And after they crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. They brought the boat to shore and climbed out and the people recognised them at once, particularly Jesus. And they ran throughout the whole area carrying sick people on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, in villages or in the countryside, they brought the sick out to the marketplace. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe and all who touched him were healed.
Morning, church. Uh, welcome to Lockdown 5.63221. Um, hopefully in this space you find some rest. Hopefully in this space you find something to contemplate and consider. So um, out of our reading today, there's a number of things that hopefully are provocative and hopefully they get you thinking. Whenever we read Mark, it's really important that we have an understanding that this is about non-violent social revolution. There are concepts within Mark, and a bit being the first gospel as well, there's concepts within this that are complete upheaval from the status quo. And it's important that we look at it in that context. And so as we go through today's reading, I'll try to point out um, where I see those things. In order to have an understanding of our narrative context today, for today's reading, we need to look back a couple of readings. Um, we have Jesus rejected in his hometown. He then sends his disciples away and out in pairs, taking nothing with them but the shoes on their feet, and maybe their walking sticks, uh, to throw themselves with vulnerability on the hospitality of communities. Uh, and those communities that don't welcome them, they are told to dust off your feet and just keep moving. There's a, it's a powerful image about how often we, we can't force the kingdom of God on people because that's what Rome does. That's, that's a violent military way of doing things. And so if you have no hospitality, if you can't offer hospitality, the kingdom of God will not be embedded there. It's interesting to think about. Um, then we have the death of John the Baptist. Speaks truth to power, um, creates, creates a, a problem of truth, and, uh, and when he creates a problem of truth, he's killed by the authorities. And that's a kind of, if we keep that in mind as we look at what happens further on to Jesus and what happens to the apostles when they speak truth to power, when they seek to establish the kingdom of God, this is what happens. However, God continues to move and grow and do ministry and social upheaval uh, to bring about justice and change. It's constantly uh, embedded in our text, but this is part of our social revolution. And then we come to today's reading. 
Now, we have in the background this mourning for John the Baptist, and as well as the success of the mission, this the messianic mission. So when the messianic mission is about, um, if you think about the creation stories where God moves over chaos and creates sustainable order, that's what happens in the messianic mission. You can't have injustice because injustice is chaos. Sustainable justice is is order, and that's what the new creation would look like. So you can expand that out across all kinds of things. So we have this success of mission being celebrated in the midst of mourning. Um, we have some exhausted disciples um, who are celebrating and yet absolutely cooked. And, and now, as they come back to Jesus, there's this, they are rushed by this crowd. Now, the issue for Jesus and the disciples is if they turn away from the crowd and don't offer hospitality and teaching to them, then all of the work that they've done previously is undermined because if the, the Pharisees, the temple elite system and Rome always take and never give, There's, it's not equitable and therefore it's not sustainable. Now, if the disciples turn away from the, uh, the need for hospitality, they have just become another version of Rome or another version of the temple elite. And so they have to find a way to, to minister and rest at the same time. Um, but this, this imagery of rest is about Sabbath and how often do we take a Sabbath from ministry? Um, how often do we rest in God for a moment, uh, let alone 24 hours? Uh, it's an interesting question to ask ourselves. This creates this beautiful image then of hungry people, tired disciples, and in the midst of that, Jesus. And so what when they retreat into the wilderness, which is an interesting image because that's where John's mission started, they retreat into the wilderness, and in, the, in that place, Jesus says, sit down. Now, in the wilderness, if we think back to what happens in wilderness spaces, when the when the Hebrew people are walking from Egypt, they're in the wilderness. And in the midst of the wilderness, God feeds them with enough. God's hospitality is enough in the wilderness. And so now we have this image of wilderness, hungry disciples, and the Messiah, and the Messiah's followers, all in this wilderness place once again. So now what happens? Well, God's hospitality becomes enough. Jesus challenges the disciples to show hospitality and they don't know how to do it. They say, what are we supposed to go and, you know, how are we going to get to, like, how are we going to spend 200 denarii? Um, interesting to note, they didn't have 200 denarii when they left on their mission and somehow they've been resourced well enough to come back with 200 denarii. They don't say, where are we going to get it from? Now, this is a powerful exchange between Jesus and the disciples. Jesus says, you feed them. This is the call to bring sustainable life into the wilderness, to be part of that. The disciples must show hospitality if this new world order, this new creation is to, to take place. But they have to do it in a way that is sustainable. It can't be destroyed. And so this miracle of feeding breaks out. This abundance and this mission can only exist if everyone has enough. If we move away from that Exodus image, that uh, everybody having enough, the food image, and consider other community resources that we believe are vital to the sustained mission of God, things like education, health, power, safety, we're, we're no longer considering just a soup kitchen, just a, a, a way of feeding people. We're considering an extravagant and communal overthrowing of social inequity. This is not the economy of finance. This is not about 200 denarii. This is the economy of truly sustainable, selfless, generous community. That is the kingdom of God. Now, I don't have time to dwell for too long on the walking of water you know, imagery in this. That will come up later on in the lectionary. But just consider the imagery of Jonah. Like we see miracle, we see call, we see new community. And we see, we, we see the disciples respond and there is this great tension in the midst of this, this great resistance to going to the other side, to moving across the waters um, and back into the chaos. And then we have a great image, a creation image again of Jesus 
just casually strolling across the water and saying, well, come on, let's, let's get this done properly. Now, they land back in Jewish, uh, Jewish territory and they're recognised. And the story tells us that the healing continues. He's not quite in Gentile community yet. He's still on the outskirts of, Jew, of Judaistic, of Jewish communities. And so they are recognised for their ministry. And it's interesting to note that the further he moves from Jerusalem, the further away from the seat of power he gets, the more ready and responsive and desiring of the Messianic mission are the people. The closer he gets to the centre of power, the more danger he is in. But the further he moves from power, the more receptive people are. What, what does that tell us about our public Christianity, our political Christianity, uh, and those who advocate for taking control of political systems on behalf of their version of Christianity? Um, what, what does that look like in our world? When, when Jesus moves away from the seat of power, he moves amongst the people who are impacted by decisions made by the political bureaucrats in Jerusalem. So when, when the chief priest opened, opened Jerusalem to be taken over without resistance by the Romans, when, when they threw open the temple and said, take, take what you need, we're, don't just don't kill us, that had massive implications for those in the Galilee base and those in the food bowl. So now they aren't just impacted by Romans and violence and, and responsibilities to, to Torah, they now have to feed the Roman military with what they have, and they have to still give arms to the temple and sacrifices to the temple. They have lost so much because of a decision made in the seat of power. Does that sound familiar to you? And the further away you move from the seat of power, the more receptive they are for a new system, a new way of being, because the status quo is not working. If we are to take this reading seriously, we are to be challenged in understanding that authenticity, our authentic journey as Christians, as disciples, comes from vulnerability. The messianic ministry, that new creation, comes from sharing our food with the hungry, not keeping a servery and regulations between us and them. True hospitality is true sharing, not a program that is top-down, because top-down programs are how Rome works, are how old temple systems work. We are now amongst our people and we eat together. If you think about what we do with communion, that is a snapshot of what the world could be like. As God moves across the waters at the beginning of Genesis, as Jesus walks across the turbulence, the messianic mission is always to recreate life in the midst of chaos. This is chaos formed by unjust power structures and self-centered individualization of society. It is called to be a messianic radical and it grounds itself in sharing food. And at this point, it grounds itself in sharing food, wearing masks, getting vaccinated, and loving your neighbor in kindness throughout lockdown. Peace be with you. I will talk to you soon. silence, a time to listen well, a time to hear the painful stories others have to tell. Oh God, may we who love to talk now hear the rage and fear. And may we learn from neighbors who have long been silenced here. There is a time for asking, a time to pause and pray. There is a time to hear the prophets speak of God's new day. 
to hear the words of Jesus who taught welcome truth and love to hear the Spirit speaking through the ones who shout enough there's time for humble study for reading and for thought God may we learn from others of the justice they have sought and may we learn from those who bravely stand against the hate so when we're called to justice we your church won't hesitate there's time for good reflection to ponder who we've been to think how our own attitudes have paved the way for sin to listen to the ones we fear to folks we may resent to hear of Jesus call to love and humbly to repent and there's a time to work now to boldly say their names to protest and to organize to advocate for change to use our voices and to stand with those who are oppressed as we seek justice hand in hand Lord may your world be blessed as we seek justice hand in hand Lord may your world be blessed Accept our prayers to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We will now do the candle prayers. As I light each candle, say a prayer to those in your heart and that you wish to remember. The Lord bless you.
bless you, bless you and keep you. Shine gently on you. The Lord be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance. As we leave this place, may you be enough. Enough that you share your food. Enough that you laugh from your belly enough that you grieve with all that you are. May you be enough, because enough is all that God is calling you to be. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ beneath, Christ above, Christ on my right and on my left.